Wanted Dead was a game I'd never heard anything about, but the pink cover in the game store really stood out to me. Sadly, the price tag at the time of almost £60 put me off, but it was something I thought I needed to pick up in the future when it finally dropped in price. When I got home from the shop, I thought I should look into it and see what type of game it actually is, and see if I had made a mistake for not picking it up. After a small bit of research, I found out it was pretty much a spiritual successor to Devil's Third. It was made by a studio known as Salil Limited, which turns out they used to be Valhalla Game Studios. This piqued my interest as I played Devil's Third at the beginning of the year in my New Game A Day challenge, and I actually really enjoyed it. Having a quick look through a couple of the reviews to see its reception, I found out it also bombed like Devil's Third, and it was even being classed as some people's worst game of the year. And if you know me, this meant I really needed to play it. I didn't go into any details of what made it so bad, I just skimmed through the Metacritic scores. I didn't want anything spoiled and I didn't want anything that would influence my playthrough or my overall thoughts of the game. So when I saw it was reduced to £20, it was a no-brainer, I had to pick it up. So let's get into it and start with what has to be the weakest part of the game, the story. Playing through the game and not skipping any cutscenes, I'm still not too sure what was going on, but this is what I figured out. The main characters are in a team called the Zombie Unit. This refers to them being a Suicide Squad style group of criminals avoiding life imprisonment by working for the government of Hong Kong, not taking down literal zombies. The main enemies in the game are called synthetics, or something. Basically, cyberpunk androids are bad kind of setup. Or you could be rescuing the synthetics instead. I don't know, this is how confused I was getting. It has a strange juxtaposition of trying to be a story about the main character Hannah Stone's struggle with what she has been through in her life, but at the same time, have an overall silly Yakuza style vibe to it. Alongside the main plot of just bad things are happening, there is a side story of Hannah's reason for being imprisoned and trying to care for a child whose parents she killed, which she did with good reason, but she did leave the child an orphan. When I say care for, it's more of a keep giving them money out of guilt situation. This is about as much as I could gather from it, but this might have been harder for me to take in as I played this game start to finish over on Twitch, so I was chatting to people at the same time. This also explains my ugly mug in the corner of all the footage. Throughout the game though, you do collect a large number of case files, which I imagine helps flesh out the story, but I find it strange if these are mandatory reading. From what I could tell, the cutscenes weren't even played in order. Flashbacks seem to be displayed in an anime style, but even the in-game engine scenes might have not been in the correct order. I don't know. Most of these in-engine scenes were just something mundane taking place, such as sitting down for food or going for a drink, but these felt like they were only there to set up upcoming mini-games more than anything else. Being in a team, you would think there'd be some great chemistry between the characters, but there doesn't seem to be. One only communicates with sign language, which at first made me think he was deaf, but no one responds to him with anything other than speech. One seems to be a serial womanizer, and guess why he was in jail, and he's not a nice guy either. The last one is a doctor who's at least useful on your team. He will pick you up if you're killed, but this can only happen once before a game over. Well, he's called Doc, so I'm guessing he was a doctor. Maybe he was just a junkie good with syringes. I think they were going for the they don't get along, but have to work together to avoid imprisonment vibe, but they all just came across as disinterested in what each other are saying, or even caring about their well-being. The only character that seems liked by them is the weapons specialist, who mostly stays back at the HQ and plays with her pussy. Cat. Now that I've mentioned absolutely nothing about the story, let's talk about the gameplay, as this is actually where I had a lot of fun with the game. The game calls itself a hack and slash shooter, which is only half right. You do use guns and spend a lot of time upgrading them through random unlocks every time you hit a checkpoint, but they're almost useless. Even fully upgraded, they hold next to no ammo, and enemies are complete bullet sponges. What you will actually find yourself doing is playing this game more like Ninja Gaiden and using a katana as your main weapon. So you need to get good at dodging and the parry system if you want to get anywhere in this game. The guns are used mainly as a way just to slow enemies down or pick off a few of the enemies that hide at the back of the map taking pot shots. I was expecting you to collect new blades to make yourself more powerful, but this is not the case. It's only the guns which get better power wise. You can carry two guns at any time. One you pick up off of enemies and the one you spend time upgrading. There's also a pistol which has unlimited ammo, but this is used more of a way to chain combos together and make the combat look more stylish. You can kill enemies with a pistol, but it takes a hell of a lot of shots. Towards the end of the game, it was getting a bit tough for me, so I was cheesing it by running away from the enemies and taking random shots with a pistol. This isn't recommended though, as each of the ninja style enemies probably took close to about 100 pistol rounds, and if you missed time running past them, you'd be down in one or two hits, and you'd be facing two or three of these at a time. How you are actually supposed to deal with the hand-to-hand -hand enemies is to use the L1 button, if you're playing on the PlayStation version, of course, like me, to parry the attacks. You press it just before a strike lands. If you do this correctly, you can either move back or go in for a hit. Later in the game, you have to parry multiple hits in a row. These multiple hits usually culminate with an unblockable hit, which you must use your pistol to counter. These are displayed by the character flashing orange for a split second. 
As I said, you cannot upgrade your katana, but you can apply new moves or things like more health packs to your character using skill points. These are essential for getting through the game as it allows for new combos, a lot which are performed after a parry. When enemies have taken enough damage, they sometimes become stunned. This allows you to run up to and press the triangle and circle button together to perform a finishing execution. These make the combat look fast and fluid and can be chained together to take out large gangs of people if they're close enough. You have one more trick up your sleeve though. As you fight, you build up a meter in the bottom left of the screen, which when full, you click both sticks together to unleash an attack where time stops and anyone close gets riddled with bullets from the pistol. This might be the only time the shots from are ever effective as it can put people close by into the stun state ready for an execution. Earlier, I alluded to the idea of mini games. This again is where the game is going to get a comparison to the Yakuza series. In between the main missions, you get a bit of downtime with some mundane activities such as eating or karaoke but these get turned into mini games. They're usually of the rhythm variety, which for me is always a plus. You also get a couple of arcade style games, one being a crane game simulator, and the other one being a full on arcade style shmup game, which isn't just a quick one or two levels, it's a full on game within a game. All of these mini games can be accessed whenever you want from the police HQ or in the main menu once they have been unlocked. Before we get into one of the main criticisms of the game, it's difficulty, let's quickly talk about its presentation. Although the game is a rather linear experience, you can tell there's a lot of attention to detail put into each of the areas to make them feel like they could actually exist. Well, after the first level at least, that's a bit cut and paste. I noticed plenty of little objects scattered around that looked like they had only been designed for that one small section, and I enjoyed this attention to detail. The animation is very smooth, and the characters have a very first party Sony feel to them. I think this could be down to the way they move, which only makes sense if you jump between consoles frequently. They feel like there is weight and momentum to their movement. Another thing that jumped out at me right away was that the game is surprisingly colourful, for what I remember being set entirely at night. The orange flashes from the enemies, the explosions, the neon lights, kept my little brain focused on the screen the whole time. Even down to the soles of the main character's shoes, there's random bits of colour to break up what would usually be a drab hallway. I'm not saying it's first party Nintendo colourful, but it's much more than what this style of game usually is. To me, most action games are still stuck in that brown Gears of War look, which are also always trying to take themselves way too seriously. The anime sections I mentioned earlier were a nice shock when they first happened. They're really well animated, and again, very colourful. So let's talk about that difficulty, shall we? The game has been designed not to be a cakewalk. It was made by some of the people behind the Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive franchises. So as with those games, it's built with the mindset that you have to learn how to play to get anywhere with it. Because of this, I wasn't really enjoying the game to start with. Standard enemies were taking me down quickly, and progress was slow. That was until the game threw me a bone. If like me, you die one too many times, it will ask you if you want to lower the difficulty to Neko-chan mode. This isn't selectable from the start, or I would have chose it. By selecting this, your character will be forced to play wearing a pair of cat ears, and you will feel unstoppable. Well, until you start to hit the large enemies with the Gatling guns, and wave after wave of ninjas. The name of the difficulty makes sense though, since Neko means cat in Japanese. Even on this difficulty, the last level of the game was a bit insane. Usually the checkpoints were plentiful, but right near the end of the game, you have to play for about 15 to 20 minutes with no checkpoints, and waves are some of the toughest enemies the game can chuck at you, which made me laugh as it's followed by a boss, which was one of the easiest in the game. These checkpoints refill your ammo and health kits. That's right, I said health kits. This isn't a game with regenerating health like we're so used to these days. If you're looking for a completion for a platinum trophy or a full Xbox 1000G, this might not be the game for you. Currently, the unlock rate for the platinum trophy is sitting at 0%, so this means there must be a glitch somewhere along the line stopping it from unlocking. Or it could just be that you have to beat the game on all difficulties. This includes the unlockable Japanese hard mode. I can't even attempt to comprehend how hard that must be since I struggled on Super Easy. If you're a seasoned hack and slash gamer and you can make it through this difficulty, you will still have to bring your shmup A game, as you have to beat a full playthrough of the included Space Runaway game on the hardest setting. Even after all this, do I recommend giving the game a go? Yes, this game is tough. The story makes no sense. The trophies and achievements don't even work properly, but this game was just stupid dumb fun. The combat would feel repetitive if it wasn't broken up by some crazy mini games, some of the weirdest cutscenes I've seen in the game for a long time. But I never got bored. It's hard for me to find games these days where I want to dive straight back in as soon as I've turned it off. But this had me coming back over a few nights to see it through. The scores I've seen it given by major gaming sites seem to sit around the 4 or 5 out of 10 region, but I can't see why. I would have easily put this in the 7s. It's not going to change the world, but if you want to lose 6 to 8 hours of your life to something entertaining, I don't think you can go wrong. It's not as in depth as combat as people into this genre might be after, but if you're a newcomer like me, the combat system felt fun and easy to understand, but hard to master. I would however recommend playing the game on the PlayStation 5, like I did, as during the stream I was told about performance issues with the Xbox One version. I'm not sure if this carries over to the Series X upgrade or not. After I beat the game on stream, I put something else on to fill up the evening, and I followed it by Dusk Diver, another 3D brawler game, and that was just terrible, but it had a similar Metacritic score. 
Moral of the story is, don't let the reviews of others influence your enjoyment of a game. That being said, go buy this.